The Great War ended in 1918. Germany and its allies were defeated. A new balance of power began to form almost as soon as the Treaty of Versailles was signed. New forms of friendship would take only 20 years for it to turn into military alliances. The next world war was brewing. The Washington Naval Treaty of 1922 between the US, the British Empire, France, Italy, and Japan limited the construction of capital ships. It forced the country signatories to review their naval doctrines and seriously consider using aircraft carriers as the backbones of their fleet, as opposed to battleships. Only 15 years later, in 1937, Japan used its recent military buildup to launch a major attack on China. Japan quickly overwhelmed all opposition with an innovative use of aviation. Japanese successes were marred by the fact that in December of the same year, the Japanese Air Force attacked and sank an American warship. The Japanese claimed that it was an honest mistake, and the crisis did not lead to immediate consequences. However, the relations between Japan and the US quickly began to turn sour. After the war began in Europe in 1939, people in the Americas were divided on whether their countries should take part or stay out. Most Americans hoped the Allies would win, but they also hoped to keep the United States out of war. The isolationists wanted the country to stay out of the war at almost any cost. Another group, the interventionists, wanted the United States to do all in its power to aid the Allies. Canada declared war on Germany almost at once, while the United States shifted its policy from neutrality to preparedness. It began to expand its armed forces, build defense plants, and give the Allies all-out aid short of war. In September of 1940, the Tripartite Pact was signed in Berlin. It solidified the relationship between the three Axis countries, Germany, Italy, and Japan. Germany crushed all opposition in mainland Europe by June the 22nd, 1941. It only took them two years. Deciding to abandon the plans to invade the British Isles, the Wehrmacht attacked the Soviet Union and quickly advanced into Russia on all fronts. At the same time, Germany's ally Japan invaded French Indochina. In response, the US embargoed the sale of scrap metals to Japan and then expanded the embargo to all oil and gasoline exports as well. This began the long and fruitless process of Japanese-American negotiations, during which both sides repeatedly stated their willingness to resolve all conflicts through diplomacy. The Japanese continued to consider peaceful solutions until the last moment. On November the 26th, 1941, with the negotiations still ongoing, a Japanese task force of six aircraft carriers, Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, Hiryu, Shokaku, and Zuikaku, departed northern Japan and headed for Hawaii. Their target was Pearl Harbor.
18 SBDs took off from the USS Enterprise on a routine scouting mission to fly ahead and land at Ford Island. The Enterprise lay 200 miles west of Oahu and was heading home. I feel that a surprise attack, submarine, air, or combined, on Pearl Harbor is a possibility. And we are taking immediate practical steps to minimize the damage inflicted and to ensure that the attacking force will pay. Husband E. Kimmel, Commander-in-Chief, U.S. Fleet. First call to colors had been sounded. About 0757, explosions were heard on the end of Ford Island, abreast dry dock number one. When the second explosion took place, it was realized that an air raid was in progress. The commanding officer, C.M. Cook, Jr., USS Pennsylvania, report of Pearl Harbor attack. December the 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The words and the date are forever etched into the American mind. In less than an hour, 18 American warships were struck. 2,386 lives were lost. However, the attack was not nearly as devastating as it could have been. The Japanese failed to damage their main target, the American aircraft carriers. These types of warship would dominate the American war effort in the Pacific. The Japanese also stopped with only two attack waves, believing that the element of surprise was lost. The danger of counterattacks from the USS Lexington and Enterprise remained high. Their location remained unknown. Critically, the U.S. intelligence services had been reading Japanese codes for some time. They understood that the attack was imminent hours before Japanese warplanes were seen over Hawaii. But a series of unfortunate events meant that the warning never reached Pearl Harbor in time. The next day, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt formally asked the Congress to declare war on Japan. By this time, Japan had already declared war on the U.S. So did its allies Germany and Italy. On December the 8th, the U.S. officially entered World War II. Immediately after the attack on Pearl Harbor, 
Japanese naval aircraft attacked Wake Island, an atoll with a military base almost 2,000 miles away from Hawaii. Japanese bombers flying from the Marshall Islands caused considerable damage, destroying 12 Marine Corps aircraft on the ground. More than 1,000 civilians and 500 armed forces personnel had no choice but to defend the island. On December 7, 1941, Japanese carrier aviation attacked U.S. bases in Pearl Harbor. Several hours later, on December 8, local time, the Japanese attacked Wake Island. On the very first day, bomb attacks destroyed most of the aircraft stationed on the island. The bombings continued for several days. On December 11, the Japanese attempted to land on the island. Some of the 4th Fleet ships headed towards Wake Island. The four remaining VMF-211 airplanes received an order to attack enemy ships. Can you hear me? Do you copy? Yeah, I hear you. Sound off. No enemy aircraft detected. I repeat, we did not detect any enemy aircraft. Roger that. Looks like the Japanese are retreating. Major attack cargo ships. I repeat, attack cargo ships in sector M9. Roger that. Let's go down and join the party. The unexpectedly strong resistance put up by the Wake Island coastal artillery and remaining aircraft forced the Japanese fleet to retreat. The island's garrison suffered very few losses. Realizing that the first landing attempt was premature, the Japanese continued bombing the island. Three Wake Island airplanes were launched when the radar picked up approaching enemy planes. Wake Island, fighting alone, still stood its ground. Two Japanese carriers, Soryu and Hiryu, which took part in the attack on Pearl Harbor, were sent to the coasts of Wake Island to back up the second landing attempt. On December 22, 39 planes were launched from the carriers to subdue Wake Island's resistance. The two remaining Wake Island airplanes entered a losing battle against the superior enemy forces.
copy? Yeah, I copy, Lieutenant. Enemy aircraft in sight. Sector D-12. Roger that. Taking a course to Sector D-12. Don't attack it alone. Okay. Meet you in Sector F-12. Roger that. December the 22nd, 1941. The Americans tried to help the beleaguered island, sending a relief force out of Pearl Harbor. The aircraft carrier Saratoga brought aircraft. Other warships carried much needed ammunition. The convoy was recalled halfway to the island as Japanese aircraft carriers were reported near Wake. Left to fight the enemy alone and with no hope of resupply, the Marines surrendered on December the 23rd. Navy announces that Wake Island is probably captured by the enemy. And now it is disclosed that 400 Marines held for at least 14 days against heavy Japanese attack. The Marines have 12 fighter planes and a small quantity of weaponry. They were commanded by a 35-year-old hero, Marine Major James P.S. Devereux. They sunk one Japanese light cruiser and three destroyers. They held out against 13 raids. This message was widely read in the US in the following days. By January of 1942, Japanese forces had landed in Burma, the Dutch East Indies, New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands. In February, 130,000 Allied soldiers were surrounded in the battle for Singapore. And in May, the remainder of the American and British forces surrendered to the Japanese in the Philippines. The US was not willing to give up. To prove that they wanted to fight on, a daring raid was launched on April the 18th, 1942. Jimmy Doolittle's B-25 bombers took off from the USS Hornet and dropped bombs on Tokyo, causing mostly psychological damage. The Doolittle raid was a huge morale boost to the US. Port Moresby in New Guinea was the next target for the Japanese fleet. It was clear that capturing this location would pave the way for a Japanese invasion of Australia. Allied forces decided to defend Port Moresby at all costs. Several Japanese fleets were tasked with supporting the attack, including the 5th Carrier Division with fleet carriers Shokaku and Zuikaku and the light aircraft carrier Shoho. The American carrier group that would fight the 5th Carrier Division was Task Force 17. It included the Lexington and Yorktown. To gain control of the Coral Sea, Japanese command sent a naval force to Tulagi Island. The Japanese were hoping to establish a naval and air base on the island. On May 4th, the aircraft carrier USS Yorktown entered the region. Bombers were launched from the carrier to stop the Japanese landing on Tulagi. Around noon, the pilots noticed several enemy hydroplanes. Yorktown fighters were sent to search and destroy them.
Heading towards the island. Maintain vigilance. The planes that attacked our bombers could be anywhere. I see them! Right into our hands. Excellent. Attack! Leave no survivors! I think that's it. Yorktown, this is Lieutenant Fenton. Do you read me? I copy, Lieutenant. Reporting the situation. Enemy planes destroyed. Repeat, enemy hydroplanes destroyed. Roger that. Great job. The ship is leaving the island. Looks like she's alone. Let's stay a while. Attack the deck. What's that? Fire on deck? Ha <laughs> looks like it. We can head back now. On May 6, 1942, after completing the landing operation in Tulagi, the Japanese aircraft carrier Shoho returned to the theater of war. She was followed by ships, which were headed towards Port Moresby. U.S. carriers Lexington and Yorktown, located further south, were searching desperately for the enemy fleet. On the morning of May 7, one of the U.S. pilots detected Japanese ships off the coast of Misima. Lexington and Yorktown carriers immediately launched an airstrike. phases of the attack, showing only the bow of the carrier, with the rest of it completely enveloped in smoke, splashes, and flames. It's difficult to conceive any other result than complete destruction of this carrier, and the personnel loss must have been close to 100%. From the bow silhouette in the photographs, plus the cutaway flight deck, the pilot's descriptions, and radio intelligence, it is believed that this carrier was the Ryukaku. Captain Frederick Carl Sherman, USS Lexington. The Battle of the Coral Sea, the first carrier battle of the war, forced the Japanese to cancel their plans to attack Port Moresby. The battle cost the Americans one of their fleet carriers, the USS Lexington. Yorktown was damaged and had to retreat to Pearl Harbor for repairs. 
While it was impossible to identify a winner of the Battle of the Coral Sea, this was the first time the Japanese failed to meet their strategic goals. It was a taste of things to come. Subsequent Japanese plans targeted American bases in the Aleutian Islands and the Midway Atoll, a tiny island lost in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The military base on Midway had been built up after the hostilities in Asia began and included three runways and dozens of aircraft. A huge Japanese fleet, comprising more than 70 ships with four aircraft carriers, Hiryu, Kaga, Soryu, and Akagi, was sent towards Midway. The Japanese strike force was split up into several smaller fleets, which greatly jeopardized their ability to work effectively together. Meanwhile, the American codebreakers continued to read Japanese messages. It did not take long for them to learn that Midway was the next Japanese target. The US Navy knew it needed every available carrier to counter the Japanese attack. The USS Yorktown, heavily damaged during the Battle of the Coral Sea and believed to be sunk by the Japanese, was repaired in a record 72-hour round-the-clock effort. It was previously believed that months of repairs were needed. A large combined fleet comprising aircraft carriers Enterprise, Hornet and Yorktown quickly set off for Midway. June 4, 1942. Japanese forces start their operation to occupy Midway Island. The surprise attack was key to the operation's success. However, Commander-in-Chief for Pacific Ocean Areas, Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, began preparations to defend Midway several months previously, basing his decision on intelligence data. While Japanese forces were approaching Midway from the east, two U.S. fleets were heading to their assembly point, Point Luck. On June 4, several minutes before Midway radar alerted of the incoming attack, PBY pilot Lieutenant 80 noticed the Japanese carrier fleet. His message read, Two carriers and battleships bearing 320 degrees, distance 180, course 135, speed 25 knots. Immediately after his message arrived, the U.S. forces started positioning themselves for the attack. Japanese fleet outnumbered the U.S. forces, so fleet commanders Fletcher and Spruance agreed it was crucial to launch an all-out attack as soon as possible. We're the torpedo bombers and fighters that were supposed to provide cover. I thought we were supposed to fly together. Communications were lost. We have to fly on our own. Keep the formation, guys. The Japanese fleet must be close by. We should have spotted them already. They must have changed course. Let's try to find them. Captain, we're running low on fuel. We need to turn back. I know. Damn it. Enemy destroyer in sight. The carriers must be somewhere nearby. Keep flying. There they are. Lieutenant, attack the one to the right. I repeat, target the carrier to the right. We'll take care of the rest. Let's give him hell, guys. Preparations for a counter-strike against the enemy had continued on board our four carriers throughout the enemy torpedo attacks. One after another, planes were hoisted from the hangar and quickly arranged in the flight deck. There was no time to lose. At 10.20, Admiral Nagumo gave the order to launch when ready. On Akagi's flight deck, all planes were in position with engines warming up. The big ship began to turn into the wind. Within five minutes, all her planes would be launched. Five minutes. Who would have dreamed 
that the tide of battle would shift completely in that brief interval of time. Captain Mitsuo Fujita, IJN Akagi. Despite heavy losses, the morning attack was a success. Three Japanese carriers were destroyed. However, the Japanese command still had Hiryu at its disposal. Planes were launched from its deck to start a counterattack. Both Japanese counterstrikes hit the same aircraft carrier. Although Yorktown was dead in the water, both TF-16 carriers remained undamaged. While the second wave of the Yorktown attack was heading to Hiryu, Enterprise and Hornet were getting ready to deliver a final blow to the Japanese carrier fleet. After the earlier attack against Enterprise, only 24 planes were able to strike the enemy. Flying without cover again? We suffered heavy losses in the battle this morning. And Yorktown was badly damaged. They need the fighters to safeguard the fleet. We will have to fly alone. We did it once already. I just hope we can pull it off one more time. Does everyone remember the plan? Just do what we did this morning. Attack with the sun behind us and take their defense by surprise. Enemy fleet ahead! Target the carrier and launch the attack. That was the last one. You think we got it? It took at least three bombs. When we were flying off, I saw it burning. Yeah, then it's done for. Through the skill and devotion to serve for the armed forces of all branches in the Midway area, our citizens can now rejoice that a momentous victory is in the making. Admiral Chester Nimitz, Commander-in-Chief, Pacific Ocean Areas, June 6, 1942. They had no right to win, yet they did. And in doing so, they changed the course of a war. Even against the greatest of odds, there is something in the human spirit, a magic blend of skill, faith, and valor that can lift men from certain defeat to incredible victory. Memorial Battle of Midway. The Battle of Midway cost the Japanese dearly. All four aircraft carriers of the Japanese first carrier striking force were lost. Hiryu, Kaga, Soryu, Akagi, nearly 250 aircraft and more than 3,000 naval personnel, including many experienced Japanese pilots, were lost. The Americans lost the aircraft carrier Yorktown and 307 men. Altogether, the Americans launched 10 attack waves against the Japanese fleet. The first eight were unsuccessful, and the last two brought an overwhelming victory. This battle marked the end of the first phase of the war. The Japanese lost their aircraft carrier superiority and would never again dominate the Pacific. Early in the war, they had 10 carriers to the American three, forcing the US Navy to adopt a defensive strategy while three more carriers were being transferred from the Atlantic. This had allowed the Japanese to operate at will. In the meantime, the Japanese continued with their attacks on the Solomon Islands and New Guinea. They had already constructed a new float plane base in Tulagi and started building an airfield at Guadalcanal. By July of 1942, Australian troops, fighting in the Kokoda Track campaign, successfully repelled the Japanese attack in New Guinea. 
If allowed to complete the airbase on Guadalcanal, the Japanese would turn the island into a powerful outpost that would hinder all US operations in a wide area. Operation Watchtower was launched to stop the Japanese plans. 75 warships and nearly 3,000 Marines were sent to the island. They were opposed by only 900 Japanese troops. And while the Americans had good intelligence on the Japanese forces on the island, the other side did not even suspect that an invasion was imminent. After the Midway Battle, which was the turning point of the conflict, U.S. forces launched an offensive attack in the Pacific Ocean. Operation Watchtower was the second major offensive attack by the U.S. Army in the war. The goal of the operation was to take Guadalcanal and the Florida Islands. Air forces stationed on the Enterprise, Saratoga, and Wasp were to start the operation. Their goal was to destroy the enemy air force and conduct bombing strikes at strategic points in the operation area. Our goal is the coast of Florida Island. We need to clear the area for landing. I see float planes on the ground trying to take off. We need to stop them. Looks like our job here is done. Let's keep on searching. More planes! Six of them! In the harbor straight ahead! I see them. We're low on ammunition. Try not to waste it. Looks like that was the last one. I'm out of ammunition. We've done our job. Let's head back to the ship. Look, down there. The landing started. The Japanese will have one hell of a morning. We will defend to the last man. Pray for our success. Last message of the Yokohama Air Group Commander, Captain Miyazaki Shigatoshi. We cleared out to keep from getting shot down by our own fighters who were going wild and shooting at everything in sight. VS-71 War Diary. The Guadalcanal and Tulagi landing was successful. However, it was just the beginning of the confrontation. In October 1942, Japan moved 15,000 soldiers to Guadalcanal, making it possible for the U.S. forces to launch an offensive attack. The attack targeted Henderson Field, an airport captured by the U.S. forces, as it was the most important strategic point on the island. 1st Marine Division was in charge of defending the airport. Japanese forces planned to attack U.S. defenses from three directions, backed by air and artillery support. the river. Come on guys, let's not make it easy for them. We're running low on fuel. Time to turn back.
many combat flights did we do today? I already lost count. What does it matter? Anyway, it's better than sitting in the trenches waiting to get hit on the head by a bomb or a shell. Stay focused, guys. This is Insight C. Our doctrine was to attack. The Japanese would catch fire very readily. Sometimes they would even blow up. Sometimes they would just drop out of formation and glide down and go into the water. Although they were hitting the field every day and made many hits on the runway, the engineers would fill up the hole and you'd be landing 15 minutes later. Major John L. Smith's after action interview. The Marines landed on Guadalcanal on August the 8th. Japanese positions in the airfield were continuously attacked from the air from that moment. Both sides continued to send reinforcements to the island for months. As the scale of the battle continued to grow, it became obvious that the battle for Guadalcanal would forever turn the tide of the war. The campaign involved nearly all branches of the armed forces. Aircraft carriers and other warships exchanged blows. Warplanes from both sides engaged in hour-long dogfights. Infantry fought desperate battles in the disease-ridden jungle. Even a few tanks managed to traverse the virtually impenetrable terrain and join the fray. The Americans fought tooth and nail and eventually gained the upper hand, losing nearly 7,000 men in the campaign. Japanese losses numbered nearly 31,000. Two more carrier battles that took place during the Guadalcanal campaign further exacerbated the Japanese situation. More experienced Navy pilots were irreplaceably lost. A year after Pearl Harbor, less than half of the December 7th veterans were still alive. They were being replaced with novices straight out of flight school. In a single year, Japan experienced an incredible mix of triumph and failure. Carrier-based war started by Japan was lost no sooner than it had begun. Even before Pearl Harbor, the US government ordered six new Essex-class aircraft carriers. In contrast, the Japanese had only one new carrier in the works. They had nothing with which to replace their losses. However, by March the 1st, 1943, Japan still occupied vast territories. The Japanese army and navy were working on new plans to reverse the course of the war in the Pacific. The war was not over yet. Japan entered the 20th century in a period of transition. A country which had isolated itself from the outside world was being reborn as a leading world power. It was opening to the world and hastened to catch up with its backlog in all the most important spheres of industry, such as shipbuilding, aviation, and engineering. 
foreign specialists were invited to train Japanese engineers, and the Japanese themselves started traveling and studying technical novelties. Over several decades, Japan managed to catch up with its backlog in the technical aspect almost from scratch and to realize itself as a power which should dominate implicitly in the region. As it started to gain power, Japan turned its attention to its neighbors, aiming at expanding its areas of influence and its territories. Thus, in 1879, the Ryukyu state located on Okinawa Island was annexed, and in 1894, Japan fought a war with China, as a result of which Japan gained the island of Taiwan. Another war over redivision of areas of influence was fought between Japan and Russia in 1904 and 1905, the main result of which was the final annexation of Korea to Japan in 1910. All those wars won at the turn of the century built up the glory of the Japanese army and navy, as well as strengthening the faith of the Japanese in their unconquerable armed forces and their confidence that Japan should become the largest state in Asia. In 1922, Japan was the first country in the world to launch a ship whose class was strictly determined as aircraft carrier. Shortly after that, aircraft carriers initially built as battleships went into service. All these facts demonstrate the importance of specifically naval aircraft in Japan. As both the army and navy possessed their own aircraft in Japan, both of them developed its aircraft quite separately. In fact, these two military forces were completely independent of each other and sometimes had utterly different views on conducting military operations and the location of those actions as well. In 1937, a new war with China began when Japan established control over the northern and central parts of the territory. In response to the war in China and the movement of troops into French Indochina, the USA placed an embargo on oil and metal supply to Japan. These materials were vital for the conduct of military operations, so Japan had to seek out another source. It was quickly found in European colonies in Southeast Asia, which automatically made them the object of military invasion. After the introduction of the embargo, the Japanese headquarters became more and more conscious that conflict with the USA and England was inevitable if the country continued its expansion southwards. And consequently, plans for a preemptive strike began to emerge. One of the possible plans even provided for striking an aircraft carrier blow on the Pearl Harbor naval base located on the Oahu island of Hawaii. However, these plans would only be implemented if peace talks failed and Japan did not succeed in convincing America in the rightness of her position. On April the 10th, 1941, Japan established the first aircraft carrier fleet comprising three divisions of two aircraft carriers each. It was the first large formation of aircraft carriers in the world. And on November the 16th, 1941, one century after American military forces put an end to the isolation of Japan, the Japanese first air fleet, including six aircraft carriers, Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, Hiryu, Shokaku, Zuikaku, left their ports and headed to Hawaii. On December 2, Japanese fleet received a telegram telling to open a top-secret envelope, the contents of which told that the Japanese Empire had decided to go to war against the United States, Britain, and Holland. On December 7, at 0530 hours, the Japanese task force turned northeast, and Akagi signaled the aircraft of the first wave to prepare for takeoff at 0615. Wheeler Field and other fields were primary targets in the Japanese attack plan. Battleships were chosen as the main targets in the U.S. fleet, since they were the prestige ships of any navy at the time.
We took them by surprise! Attack hangers in the airplanes at the airport! Japanese pilots had maps to orient themselves above the Pearl Harbor naval base. The second wave consisted of 171 planes, 54 B-5N5s, 81 D-3A1s, and 36 A-6M2s. sat in front of the maps in the operations room, expecting to hear reconnaissance reports from the Tone and Chikuma seaplanes, which had been dispatched about 30 minutes before. The first report from the Chikuma's plane came in. It read, the enemy fleet is not in Lahaina Anchorage. The enemy fleet is in Pearl Harbor. How pleased we were to receive this report. Instinctively, Admiral Nagumo and all of his staff officers looked at each other and could not suppress their smiles. The only thing remaining was to await the results of the attack. Vice Admiral Ryunosuke Kusaka, Chief of Staff, First Air Fleet. Japanese forces estimated results of the attack on Pearl Harbor to be phenomenal. They achieved complete surprise, and according to pilots' reports, several ships and a large number of aircraft were destroyed. American forces in the Pacific suffered shattering losses. Several battleships, the pride of both sides' navies, were destroyed. Japan implemented an unprecedentedly bold plan. Six aircraft carriers came almost close to the naval base of the enemy, attacked it suddenly, and achieved complete success in their attack. It was the real triumph for the Japanese Navy. Besides success in Pearl Harbor, the Japanese forces managed to occupy a small island of Wake, which was located in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and had a runway defended by a small marine garrison. Though not without losses among warships, the island's defense was overwhelmed and the landing troops freely landed on its territory. In January 1942, Japan landed its forces in Burma, the Dutch East Indies, New Guinea, and Solomon Islands. On February the 15th, it surrounded 130,000 soldiers during the Battle of Singapore. And in May, the rest of American and English forces yielded themselves in the Philippines. Occupation of all these territories was stipulated by the general plan before the beginning of the war. Therefore, all subsequent military actions were conducted by Japan in accordance with new plans which were developed after the beginning of the war. 
Inspired by success of the first months of war, the Japanese considered that they could act on the offensive in utterly different divisions simultaneously. And then the Japanese needed to seize Port Moresby, the major stronghold of the Allies, which was both the way to Australia and the last bulwark of the Allies in the region. The plans also included occupation of the Tulagi Island, aimed at establishing a float seaplane base there. Japan established several formations for the operation, so each of them could act promptly and independently of others. This tactic, as they believed, allowed them to fulfill several tasks simultaneously. The 5th Aircraft Carrier Division was assigned for the operation. It comprised Zuikaku and Shokaku aircraft carriers, which were to protect the landing force by the aircraft. On May 7, 1942, a massive attack launched from American carriers Lexington and Yorktown destroyed light carrier Shoho, the leader of a group of ships heading towards Port Moresby. When Shoho was destroyed, the remaining ships from the group turned north. The ships heading towards Port Moresby were also forced to retreat. Lexington and Yorktown continued their search for the Japanese fleet. Meanwhile, two Japanese carriers, Shokaku and Zuikaku, sailed around the Solomon Islands and headed towards Port Moresby. On the morning of May 8, the Americans detected the Japanese fleet and launched an airstrike from both carriers. from southwest-west. Zika fighters attack enemy planes. Repeat, Zika crash fighters attack enemy planes closing in from the west. Roger that. Attention, another enemy group closing in. Zika fighters, move to intercept. Roger that.
them off. All head back to Zuikaku. Good day's work, everyone. I hope our bombers made it hot for them. While Japanese fighters were defending Shokaku and Zuikaku, Japanese bombers were approaching the Lexington and Yorktown. Amidst this fantastic rainfall of anti-aircraft and spinning planes, I dove almost to the water surface and sent my torpedo into the Saratoga-type carrier. I had to fly directly above the waves to escape the enemy shells and tracers. In fact, when I turned away from the carrier, I was so low that I almost struck the bow of the ship, for I was flying below the level of the flight deck. I could see the crewmen on the ship staring at my plane as it rushed by. Lieutenant Commander Shigekazu Shimazaki, IJN Zuikaku. The Battle of the Coral Sea became the first serious test for the Japanese aircraft carrier Navy, as it was the case when Japanese aircraft carriers met American ones. And the Japanese undoubtedly called this battle their victory. They considered two aircraft carriers of the enemy to be probably destroyed. However, after the attack, the covering forces had two little planes left, so they had to postpone the landing on Port Moresby itself for an uncertain period of time. However, Tulagi Island was occupied, which strengthened the position of the Japanese on the Solomon Islands. The seizure of Port Moresby was considered an army operation, and the Navy was preparing another operation at the same time aimed at luring and destroying the rest of the American aircraft carriers. Now, after the Battle of the Coral Sea, the Americans were likely to have fewer aircraft carriers left, which made fulfillment of this task easier. Seizure of a military base on the Midway Atoll was to become a bait for the Americans. The Japanese reckoned that the enemy could not allow the loss of this strategic point and would surely answer the challenge, where there would be an armada of aircraft carriers and battleships waiting for the enemy. At the same time, the Navy was conducting an operation of landing on the Aleutian Islands, which would become another pivot in the war against the Allies, which Japan was waging on many fronts simultaneously. In early June 1942, a huge Japanese fleet comprising over 70 ships and four aircraft carriers, Hiryu, Kaga, Soryu, Akagi, moved out towards the Midway Atoll. 4 June, end day minus three for Operation MI, Japanese naval operation for occupation of Midway Island. Military base at the end of the Hawaiian Island chain, a vital outpost for the U.S. naval forces. First carrier striking force and Midway invasion force approximately 300 miles out, approaching Midway from the northeast and the southeast. 
Early morning that day, first carrier striking force under the command of Vice Admiral Nagumo Chuichi begins the first phase of operation. Airstrike on Midway Atoll Base. I saw the bombs released over Sand Island and then had to hug the ground as six planes released their bombs over the Eastern Island and they landed close to my position. The dive bombers came out of the sun a few minutes later. They appeared to be Aichi 99s. The Zeros came in strafing immediately afterward. I saw two Brewsters trying to fight the Zeros. One was shot down and the other was saved by ground fire covering his tail. Both looked like they were tied to a string while the Zeros made passes at them. Statement of 2nd Lieutenant Charles S. Hughes, USMCR, June 4, 1942. Still unaware of the three U.S. aircraft carriers, the Japanese fleet was preparing a second attack on Midway. Nine fighters from Kaga provided the fleet with air support. Their number was increased after a B-17 attack, originating from Midway. The Japanese launched the fighters that were supposed to cover the bombers during the second attack on the island. Operations for a counter-strike against the enemy had continued on board our four carriers throughout the enemy torpedo attacks. 
One after another, planes were hoisted from the hangar and quickly arranged in the flight deck. There was no time to lose. At 10.20, Admiral Nagumo gave the order to launch when ready. On Akagi's flight deck, all planes were in position, with engines warming up. The big ship began to turn into the wind. Within five minutes, all her planes would be launched. Five minutes. Who would have dreamed that the tide of battle would shift completely in that brief interval of time? Captain Mitsuo Fujita, IJN Akagi. The Battle of Midway did not appear a complete defeat for the Americans, but it did destroy all the four Japanese aircraft carriers, including Hiryu. During the battle, the Japanese repelled all the first attacks, but only the two last attacks turned out to be decisive for the battle. The Japanese tactics of conducting operations fell short, and now the Japanese had to reconsider it. However, Japan had successfully landed on the Aleutian Islands, and it was time now to fortify the positions on the occupied territories by turning them not only into fortresses, but also into big airfield junctions. Besides, after the battle, several American aircraft carriers were also damaged, so the Americans suffered great losses, which demonstrated to the Japanese that the enemy would not be able to act on the offensive actively for some time. An airfield under construction on the Guadalcanal Island was to become one of the bases which would allow the Japanese to consolidate firmly their positions on the Solomon Islands. However, the Americans learned of that construction and landed troops on the island. They seized the airfield without a blow and commenced proceeding with its building up. The Japanese could not conceive that the Americans could fortify their position there, so the army landing troops were supposed to throw them back to the sea without any problem. Unfortunately for the Japanese, they underestimated the enemy forces and failed to dislodge the enemy by their first attacks. The battles on Guadalcanal and around the island grew into a prolonged military campaign. August 7, 1942. American troops land on Tulagi and Guadalcanal Islands, aiming to overtake them. Caught off balance, Japanese forces were unable to hold their positions. Guadalcanal was taken. But the Battle of Guadalcanal was still ahead. Just two weeks later, the Japanese command gathered the combined fleet to the north of the islands, preparing to strike back. Operation KA's first phase included finding and destroying U.S. aircraft carriers. While the airplanes that were launched from the light aircraft carrier Ryujo were bombing Henderson Field, Admiral Nagumo's main forces, which included Shokaku and Zuyaki carriers, were standing by and waiting for the information on the location of the U.S. fleet. 
On August 24, Nagumo received a message that cost three scout plane pilots their lives. the plan, break into three groups and attack the fleet from different directions to confuse the defense line. Keep your eyes open! Enemy fighters can come at any minute. The enemy is falling behind. Looks like they are turning back. Take a course to our ship. Enemy carrier was hit by at least three bombs. He suffered moderate losses. Roger that. Thanks for the good news, Lieutenant. In October 1942, Japan sent 15,000 troopers to Guadalcanal, which allowed offensive actions. While Marayama's troops were fighting desperately on land, trying to take Henderson Field, the fourth battle between Japanese and U.S. carrier forces began several hundred miles to the northeast of the island. Mistakenly believing that Henderson Field had been taken, the Japanese fleet was approaching the islands in three separate groups to provide support to the ground forces. American defense forces to put up furious resistance. Stay in close formation and get ready to defeat enemy attacks. We damaged one of those carriers for sure! Hornet attacked by orange carrier planes at 0911. Several bomb hits, one or more torpedo hits. Now dead in water and burning someone. Northampton preparing to take in tow. Marines landed on Guadalcanal on August the 8th. Japanese positions in the airfield were continuously attacked from the air from that moment. Both sides continued to send reinforcements to the island for months. As the scale of the battle continued to grow, it became obvious that the battle for Guadalcanal would forever turn the tide of the war. The campaign involved nearly all branches of the armed forces. Aircraft carriers and other warships exchanged blows. Warplanes from both sides engaged in hour-long dogfights. Infantry fought desperate battles in the disease-ridden jungle. Even a few tanks managed to traverse the virtually impenetrable terrain and join the fray. The Americans fought tooth and nail and eventually gained the upper hand, losing nearly 7,000 men in the campaign. Japanese losses numbered nearly 31,000. Two more carrier battles that took place during the Guadalcanal campaign further exacerbated the Japanese situation. More experienced Navy pilots were irreplaceably lost. A year after Pearl Harbor, 
less than half of the December 7th veterans were still alive. They were being replaced with novices straight out of flight school. In a single year, Japan experienced an incredible mix of triumph and failure. Carrier-based war started by Japan was lost no sooner than it had begun. Even before Pearl Harbor, the US government ordered six new Essex-class aircraft carriers. In contrast, the Japanese had only one new carrier in the works. They had nothing with which to replace their losses. However, by March the 1st, 1943, Japan still occupied vast territories. The Japanese army and navy were working on new plans to reverse the course of the war in the Pacific. The war was not over yet. 